Hey everyone and welcome to Fanya Mambo Africa. A cold day in Nairobi from the look of things clearly. No, we're not feeling cold. We're just pretending. No, but it is, pretending. Cold. <laughs> it is cold. It is cold. Yeah, karibu sana fanya mambo. Ah, thank you very much. Happy to be here as usual. Karibu sana. Yeah. And uh, today I want us to start a bit different. Okay. Um, I know we used to are doing a lot of uh, starting with our home ground yes, on yes. what is happening locally. But today yeah. I want us to go the Pan-African way for some reason. Yes. Yes. Um, what's, what is the latest news you've had about Africa, anywhere in Africa? I love what's happening in West Africa. I love that they're beginning to take sides on the Russia-Ukraine war. I wish they never did. But I think they are taking an African side to the war. Because African. for the longest time, it was either we are siding with Russia or we are siding with Ukraine, which I think was stupid. Now they are beginning to see as Africa, we are charting our own course. We are making our own decision. I have seen them pull out ambassadors from Ukraine. I have seen them dissociate themselves with Ukraine. I have seen them trying to tell Russia, wait a minute. Now the fact that we are disassociating with Ukraine does not mean we are in bed with you, which is a good thing. I think Africans need to start determining. I'm, I have not seen African countries that have got military training bases in Russia or Ukraine why has the European nations found it very necessary to have their training bases in all the places of Africa? Uh, they have mountains in their place, lest they let them not argue about terrain. They have everything. I think Russia, the only thing they don't have is summer from January to January like ourselves. So when we start saying that we are pursuing an African agenda in a war that is between Ukraine and Russia, I think that's a very beautiful position. I actually like the African agenda, and it started um, sometimes back when they started sending away troops from uh, France and just telling them, we are done with you. We want to do our thing our own way in what interests us as Africa, which is an amazing thing to do and to watch unfold in our generation. So to be particular, we've seen that Mali um, a few days ago cut ties with Ukraine for a reason. And the reason is that there was a war that was happening at their, some town, and this war where Mali soldiers and part of uh, what is called the Wana group from um, Russia, which was helping Mali guys do the whole uh, clearance of uh, the terror groups, fight them. And in this fight, unfortunately, we lost some soldiers from those troops. Now, what happened is that uh, Ukraine actually announced that they were part of this um, group, that information they were getting so they could uh, mount the attack was based on informants. So now, on the other hand, the Mali um, minister for, I think, information security and something has made it official that indeed Ukraine was involved in the killings of these soldiers. What's your take on that? I think that first and foremost is unfortunate that Russia and Ukraine will have their war fought on African soil because those are the two nations that are fighting. It is also unfortunate that African soldiers are carrying either Russian weapons or Ukrainian weapons in their hands and killing Africans from Mali. That is the most annoying part about it. Because sometimes we tend to take a geopolitical look at things and we forget the, we forget the African perspective to it. There is a Mali guy carrying a gun shooting another guy from Mali and one Mali guy is carrying a Russian gun and the other one on the other side is carrying a Ukrainian weapon. The two weapons don't belong to them. The war does not belong to them. And Mali needs every African in Mali and Mali can come together and Mali can agree. But we have to stop as African fighting those battles. And when Ukraine comes and says we, we claim responsibility for this, let us be very careful. Because sometimes you wake up and start, in war, start fighting wars that don't belong to you. So I think it's a high time as Africa, we said, um, the biggest beneficiaries after all, after, out of this war, are the, the weapon manufacturers and sellers, who are the same people we are fighting against. I have not seen an African nation that is making very good rifles to, to brag about. So even if we decide to go at war with each other, we will benefit the economies because arms are not cheap. Arms are not swords. They are not the stones we use during our mandamano. They are very expensive weapons. And every time we need to buy weapons to fight our own brothers, we benefit the two nations out there. So it's good for us to be careful, and it's good for Africa and the whole of the Western region, uh, re African region to say, wait a minute, what is the African agenda in this war? And to Africanize the war and decide that we want a selfish African agenda in the war. Let Ukraine and Russia fight their battles.
And um, having seen uh, the whole Russia war, Russia Ukraine war happen that's been going for over two years now, and we've seen that um, most of the Western world, say the US, Israel, uh, France, all of them have been supporting Ukraine in this war. Why is it that then? Could we say that since uh, France uh, soldiers were sent away from Mali, is it that they are trying to take revenge on African soil? Because look at it this way. When they were there, all they've been doing is um, neocolonizing Mali. All they did was take resources from Mali and take them to France or Paris or wherever you want to look at it. So is it that now um, could uh, France be taking a revenge on African soil because they were sent away, but then using, um, you know, Ukraine as the puppet in this case. France is a tick. France is a tick that has always fed on the blood of the people they colonized. They have nothing to brag about in their economy. I, I like the Germans, they make Mercedes, they make Audi, they make BMW. The France tried a car which we are not very sure has succeeded. What, what comes from that country? What exports do they have? Um, some expensive suits and they buy a lot of flowers and they are full of love songs here and there. I mean, it's an economy that will survive without Africa. And that's why we are saying we want an end to this French nonsense in the whole of Africa. Because they are a tick that feeds on the blood of other people. And all the time they are riding on the backs of Africans and sucking their blood. Let them get out, let us see whether that French, French economy is going to survive. So we don't want countries whose only, you know, when they are doing their budget, they are budgeting even for the money that will come from Africa. Let them go and budget for their cars, those I don't even want to mention the brand there, that is not selling anything in the market. Let, let them get serious. Uh, you know, I once had a French car, and when you are looking at things like the fuses for the car, the most important fuse for them, fuse number one, is for the radio. So for them, if it's not even the electronics, it's not the lighting, it's not even the washer or the, the airbags. The first fuse is radio. That's the Frenchman for you. So he's always here thinking that life is a joke. In Africa, we are not going to allow that. And I'm glad that the African countries are saying no to these Frenchmen and their jokes. Yeah. And uh, now I would want to know what would be the African agenda in this case? Because uh, be it the reality... The African reality agenda first been... is this is our land. Yes. Why are your troops roaming all of our land and making African women pregnant? You should go to Nanyuki here. There are so many young boys who look like they are confused. They are 0.5. They are told Mutoto ya Muzungu and they are broke. They are living in a madhouse. Those people just come here and there's been lots of cases in courts of people. These soldiers being accused of rape and those cases don't go far. So there's nothing really beneficial they bring here other than spoil our soil, you know, rape our girls and do all sorts of horrible things. Let them go and train in their country. Uh, they are always preparing for what I don't know again is true. In Africa, we are always dancing, having a party. We have our lives. In fact, war is the last thing on our minds. And that's why we don't design weapons. They are always making weapons because they are always thinking of fighting. Our African agenda, if you ask us, is one, population control. Two, we want infrastructure. Three, we want food security. Four, we want education for our people. War is the last thing on our agenda items. But for them, war is the first thing. In fact, they have more resources allocated to defense than even education. So here it's the reverse. We allocate more to education than defense. So let them take their wars out there. They can go fight each other. They can give us the results. We know who won. But as far as Africa is concerned, our agenda is to educate our children, to feed our children, and to have food security. I would want to hear from you uh, when those are very pregnant points you're making, but from a perspective of uh, the leadership we have, I mean, pretty most of the African countries have been independent for, say, 60, 65 years, most. I don't think there's actually a nation that has hit 70 years independent. Um, with that in mind, why is it then that we have not managed to push our own agenda, but our agenda is always um, pushed either by the West nation? If it's not the US, it's France. If it's not uh, France, it's Germany. If it's not Germany, I know, like, why do we have to have someone else setting the agenda for us? Yet we, you're stating things that we understand we should be caring about. We elected horrible leaders, full stop. Why is West Africa doing better now? It's because they've decided now we are not going to choose puppets of the West. We are going to choose people who care for Africa. And you've seen what the leaders in West Africa are doing. Look at Burkina Faso. That guy is doing brilliant. He's doing good stuff. So we need to get to a point where as Africans we start saying, wait a minute. Why are you sending to a fool to a war that has got brilliant heads? And Africa is not short of brilliant people. It has very, very many clever people. 
All we need to do is to start removing the fools from parliament and from state house and start electing the very brilliant minds that mean well for Africa. And this, 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 this place will change. This place will change for us because it will be our agenda first. And you know the most interesting thing you're quoting West Africa where most of these nations, Burkina Faso, um, Mali, Niger, all of them have done a change and it's military hunters were in power. So it was through coups. So are we set that coups is the only way we will change is, or how do we go about that? Is there a nation on earth that was not born out of violent upheaval? The United States is a product of war. In the 1700s, they fought for the independence. Kenya is a product of war. We fought for our independence. Those guys did not give us independence. We beat them up day, moon, morning, night. We beat them up. You know, um, Tanzania is a product of independence. If you have, if, of war, if you are forgetting the Hehe Rebellion, people who were told they were smeared with water were told this will help you from the British bullets. They were shot like, you know, but they fought. So there is no nation that is not a product of a violent upheaval. I do not know one nation, even Ethiopia, for them to fight the Italians and take them home. Uh, those funny guys who are beaten up. <laughs> so, so, so are you saying coup is the way to go? I don't mind I personally not if it works, coup actually. coup is the way to go. I am saying that sometimes you have to remove the rubbish. Whatever the formula you use, you can use an election, you can use a coup. Just remove rubbish and put good leadership. Full stop. You decide the formula as a nation. For some nations, they've waited for elections. Um, others, like Rwanda, you know how they... The, the, you have a benevolent dictator, I must say. He's done well. Rwanda is not what it was when he took over. Um, as to whether they have human rights is another question altogether. But actually, it's political rights they don't have. But they have dignity. You know, they, 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 have, they live clean lives and so on and so forth. So you choose as a nation. I mean, if you want to go the Bangladeshi way and sleep on the king's bed, that's your problem. But choose your way as a nation and do a violent upheaval to remove the bad leaders from leadership and put in good ones. And you know, now that you've touched uh, Bangladesh, the prime minister took refuge. I think she's now in India at the moment or somewhere there. And she should have taken refuge in the sky. This is what will happen to every leader who doesn't listen. Bangladesh is, is it's, it's a mirror. It's, it's a mirror that William Ruto should walk into and just look at that mirror. Every person who feels that you can do what you want to do as a president, just go into a mirror and see Bangladesh and see yourself taking the same route. This is 2024. People will not lead nations the way they want. They will listen to the voters and they will do what the general population wants and they will do the right thing and they will shun corruption. And I can tell you, if these young people invaded parliament, they may have faded right now, but one thing will happen that will make them regroup again. Bangladesh can happen anywhere in the world. How is it that they were able to do, because their devils were actually, I think, two weeks, and within two weeks, the PM, who's been in power for 15 years, is out. How was that? What would you say pushed her to that level that it was easy for them to do it? It was not easy for them to do it. But it was easier for them to do that than to live the impoverished life that they were living. When you see young people choosing the streets, they are finding that dying of bullets is easier than dying of heavy taxation and watching their politician buyers watch for 3 million, 4 million, bed, bell shoes, yeah, 17 million. For them, it is easier to be on a street and to take tear gas and to be thrown into a police cell and to go through all sorts of atrocities than to see one MP wake up one morning, wear white trousers and go donate 20 million in one Harambe. And he's waiting for the next Harambe to donate another 20 million. And this is a pauper who had nothing before that. And is a person who has never seen the doors of high school. And the people who are on the streets are master's holders. So it has to get to a point when you choose what is the pain that you want to go through. Do you want to go through a long pain, a peaceful process, a peaceful nation where you as a master's holder, you are out for five years doing mitkazi mijengo, or do you want to get to a point where you go to the street and you prick the, uh, the wound and you remove the pass once and for all? So for Bangladesh, what happened is they had enjoyed 15 years of peaceful suppression. And so it was busting. They said, wait a minute, there has been peace but we have not been at peace in our hearts. And that's what burst out. You know, sometimes people think that peace is the absence of war. No, there was no war in Bangladesh, yeah. but the people's hearts were not at peace. 
And so when they were they had a chance to come out, they were waiting for the least, you know, prick or motivation, which I believe must have come from Nairobi. And they said, This is it, and we are going. So having a peaceful nation doesn't guarantee that things are okay. Sometimes you have a peaceful nation, but there is need to go out there and fight. Are you peaceful as a Kenyan currently? I'm not peaceful as a Kenyan currently. <laughs> and the reason I'm not peaceful as a Kenyan currently is as we speak right now, the best of the leadership that this country should have had is out on the streets. That's, the bulk of those young people who we are demonstrating and being shot were brighter than the members who we are sitting in parliament and making horrible decisions for them. And so we need to reverse that so that our MPs are out on the streets demonstrating and the young people who are brilliant brains go into parliament. So we are not peaceful. And when, when, when you sit down and see, I was watching um, that MP like showcase his watch and it's worth 17 million in a country where 60% of the youth are unemployed. What does it make you feel as someone who understands things? People are struggling to fix a meal. Others are eating one meal a day like a dog. And you then come and flaunt a watch worth 17 million. And he's lucky they didn't do what the young people saw, say, call Kuku Salimia. Those are people who need greetings. For you to explain to us how it comes all of a sudden, you're able to afford a watch worth 17 million. And by the time you're buying a watch worth 17 million, there's a lot around you that is wrong. And so we need to get to that level where we are saying this is not acceptable. And I'm happy that Kenyans are saying it's not acceptable. Is there an uprising that's happening in Africa? Because it started in Kenya, I believe. Then we've seen it in Uganda. We've seen it in Nigeria. We've seen it in West Africa. West Africa actually had their uh, uprising a while back. Mm -hmm. Now, is it the same across this uh, eastern you know, and central? West Africa is a special case. You know, usually we used to have the all-Africa military games. I don't know whether they are still there. West Africa, they play the real ones, where the armies try to overthrow governments. You know, as we send people to go and run their 100 meters, 800 meters, because we are saying it's all Africa military games. Theirs is not all Africa military games. It is coup d'etats, and they, they, are, they are famous for that. They, they will do a coup d'etat when they have an opportunity. Sometimes they do it because they can. Uh, here in Africa, we, here in Kenya, we've been a little bit civil. Our military has been very professional. Our military, even you know, when the president sent them to the streets to beat up young people, they ended up greeting them and hugging them and saying, hey, we are trained to kill, not to beat up civilians. And so they left and went to the barracks. So kudos to our Kenya army. I don't remember them touching a single soul. Um, it's a different case in Uganda, because there the army is used to do all sorts of bad work, including removing dead dogs from the road. So I am happy that we, as, as Kenya, we have something that we can show the world that we have a military that is professional. Would you rather have a military that's just professional as they watch things go south in a country? Or would you rather have a military that takes over like in West Africa and fixes the nation? The problem we have is that some of the political appointments and the military at the very top are very political. And so even some of those generals in our country are not independent thinking. And the independent thinking ones have never found their place as generals. They never go beyond brigadier. So it is very hard for this country. Politicians control the army and money controls the army. So I think let us remain as we are in Kenya. It's a beacon of peace because we still need peace. We have young children. We, we have a future to build for them. And we even have the old people that we care for. Let us remain peaceful. But I How know will you build a nation? A, mm -hmm having been peaceful but then things are not functional we have so a robust democracy in this country and in fact um, um if they were to constitute ibc for us this time round, kenyans will vote very differently and i can tell you they'll vote out the rubbish that is for sure 2027 the people between 16 and 40 are 16 million years they are 16 million voters and if those people decide to vote for one of their own i can tell you the whole old crop is going home and um, I like the way you're very optimistic. However, I cannot guarantee you that your optimism will What if I vote yield. for president and the 16 million of them vote for me? Yeah. Where will the problem be? There's no problem. You just need to convince me and this no, million others convinced. to vote They've for They've already me. convinced themselves. They've already convinced one another. Uh, they love me very much if you didn't know. And they will oh. vote for me if I offer myself. So the, the, the million dollar question here should be, see, so election, Kesho. 
Okay. So the young people are ready. And now, are before, you know, the young people are actually calling for re-election. And that's why yesterday, which was Nanenane demonstrations, they were on the streets again. However, the numbers were not as huge as they were when the whole demo thing began. What do you think is causing this change? Um, first and foremost, Gen Z, if you can listen to me, they made a mistake. What you do is when you're a footballer, you live when you are at the peak of things, when everybody wants you, when people have not had enough of you, you pull out. So that the last memory they have of you is when you are at the top. Look at, I can give you the best example of Usain Bolt. He left athletics at a point in time when he was a world record holder. And he was doing so well and people were thirsting before anybody defeated him. The last memory we have of him in athletics is at his peak. On the 25th, when the youth occupied parliament, they should have ended their demos on that day. Without and achieving waited. their goal? No, no, no. The, you remember the day they occupied parliament? They should have ended their demos on that day on a very high note. And when they end their demos, because the president, remember, he came and uh, dissolved his cabinet. Then give him about a month. Whenever they say we are going to the street, the memory the president will have is the 25th. When you live at your highest... People always remember your last encounter. And the last encounter was the one they went through Parliament and sat and said, Mr. Speaker, sir, and ate rice, which was on the menu for that day. It was the special diet for the day. They ate that one. And they took the mess, and I don't know where it is. If they had left it at that, any time they threatened to go for Mandamano, the last memory the president will have and all the security forces will be that these young people occupied Parliament. They can occupy anywhere else, and they'll be listened to. But right now, when you do others that are diluted, they'll be saying, ah, the last memory, we just wasted tear gas canisters on the streets. And we were chasing Kasma, Kasamuel, Makaure all over the place, and we discovered he can also run in a suit. So they should not have allowed themselves to belittle the achievements of the 25th. But they don't listen. They are my friends, and I love them, and I respect their fight. But they should have listened to us when he told them the 25th was the peak. Leave it at the peak. What, should, what do you think they should do next? Because they've, they've pushed, they've pushed, and they keep on pushing. Withdraw for now. I mean, there are many ways of fighting. You remember, there's a time they decided to send emails to an agency somewhere. And they spammed that email box, and then, <laughs> then those people had to call. I mean, they had a million of them sending emails to an address I don't want to mention. And that it address, was open. It was the IMF. Yes, and the, and the IMF had to call the had uh, to call State House and say, "Wait a minute, we have more than a million emails, and we don't know what to do with them." They had gotten to a place when they wanted to change their ISDN, and all of them call nine one one. That would have been a disaster, having two hundred thousand people calling nine one one every other minute. There are many ways of demonstrating. In fact, if these people retreat and start using their phones and their laptops to demonstrate, I saw the other day they even took Google images of State House and they were saying the bank is ready and it's waiting for them, the food has been set. There are many ways of demonstrating. So if I was the young people, you end it on a high, the streets at 25th, to show them that we can do streets. And then now you come and start another fight, like what they had started with that uh, IMF thing, and start a fight that... The government will always be taking notes and saying, wait, now we are getting calls from IMF. Oh, World Bank is calling. Oh, White House is calling. Oh, the German, and the German, uh, you know, put up a fight that at every point you do it, you are leaving it at its peak. When they tell you stop sending emails, they'll be remembering a time when IMF got a million emails. So they don't want you to go that direction. You tell them we have a new strategy. They tell you before you try the new strategy, what do you want? You'll be listened to, but never dilute what you've done. Cool, that's interesting. And uh, something else that has happened is the, the new cabinet that the president formed with what he's been calling a broad-based government has been sworn in. What do you feel about that and what are the expectations that now Kenyans have at this point? Because they were not happy with that cabinet, straight up. Are you sure you want to hear? You know... <laughs> Let it go. The people of Mombasa... You know, the Kenyan cabinet composition can be compared to a national football tournament, a league, a premier league of the nation. So the people of Mombasa choose Ronaldo Ali Hassan Joho as their striker for that premier league. The people of Kakamega decide, let us get a retired player. So they get Didier Drogba 
or Paranya as their lead striker. Now the people of Kisi are hilarious because the people of Kisi brought a guy in a t-shirt written Shabana FC Litoke Umwano Baba. <laughs> we are still trying to figure out who their striker is. Meru is even more interesting because they don't know it's a national premier league. They've brought a linesman in the name of Kiture Kindiki to play against Ronaldo, Ali Hassan Joho. And then the people of um, Rift Valley decide to get messy William Samoy Arapu. And by the way, he's very messy in politics. So they have a messy in their football league. And then the people of Mount Kenya now decide that there's a lady called Alice Wahome Kadenke Nampira. That's the one who is going to face Ali Hassan Joho, who is like Ronaldo. And so the football match is about to come in 2027. And so Didier Drogba Oparanya comes and meets with Alice Wahome, eh? Kadenge Nampira Alice Wahome, and you know, just start laughing. And, 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 and you look at Ali Hassan Joho coming. He's the Ronaldo and he's got the ball. And then he comes and meets with a linesman called Kindiki Kiture. And what happens? Meru Nil, ha, Mombasa Five. Yeah. Now, Messi, uh, William Samoy Arap Ruto, when he's playing in this league, comes. And by the time he gets to Kisi, he finds a guy with a t-shirt written, Shabana FC, Ritoke. What has Ritoke got to do with football at this Premier League level? There are regions that have lost politically. There are regions that will never be the same. Because you have brought the best striker from Mombasa. And you have put him in a match with a retired one. And then in Mount Kenya, in Meru, you are bringing a, a linesman a linesman to play against Ronaldo. Mount Kenya is going into political oblivion. This cabinet was about that. He made sure that the people he collected in Mount Kenya cannot marshal 200 people to a Nyumba Yakumi meeting. Nyumba, yeah, you know Nyumba Kumi? If they wanted a Nyumba Kumi meeting in the village, any person who was chosen in cabinet in Mount Kenya cannot marshal 10 people. And then for Mombasa, he gets the best. For Western, he gets the best. For every other region, he gets the best. And he himself is the messy of politics. He messes everybody up. And he makes sure that Rift Valley gives the best. We are about to see a situation whereby the biggest voting block in Kenya, Mount Kenya, would be disenfranchised. Not because they don't have votes, but because they sent people with knives to a bomb fight. And they are being bombed left, right, and center. And they are trying to pull out their pen knives. Why are you bringing knives to a Kalashnikov fight? So Mount Kenya is going to political oblivion with this cabinet, and I can tell you this was a political cabinet. It had nothing to do with service delivery. William Samoy Ruto does not care if you guys don't get medicine. He doesn't care if you don't get dams. He doesn't care if you don't get water. He cares he gets re-elected in 2027. This cabinet is about his re-election, period. But this is what Gen Z's have been fighting. The whole idea of you imagining that but now what he did. What made them imagine that William will listen to them? William doesn't even written, listen to Ruto. Even Ruto doesn't listen to William. William will come on Monday and say there will be no politicians going for Harambe. Then Sunday morning he goes to a church and presides over Harambe. William doesn't listen to Ruto and Ruto does not listen to William. What makes you think he'll listen to Gen Z's? The point is he doesn't have to listen. The point is Gen Z's are coming up with the new strategy for Kenya, the Kenya they want, which has nothing to do with Mount Kenya, Western, whatever blocks. But he realized he can shoot them, fail to apologize, and fail to have even a commission. It is nothing that has been done as reparation for these young people. He realized he can do anything he wants and get away with it. So and that's the unfortunate bit, and that's why I've told the young people, at some point then you regroup and ask yourselves, what other weapons do we have at our disposal? Sometimes you don't have to win a fight the same day you start the fight. The World War took many years. First World War, the Second World War. If it means waiting for three years, sharpening our tools, preparing our arsenals, and the best of the weapons we have is the ballot. And to make sure we ashamed them at the ballot. It's still a win for the Gen Z's. Because they have managed to show the nation that they stand for what is right. And the nation will stand with them. And the question is, when we speak about uh, <clears throat> democracy of nations, and for Kenya in particular, then is it a suggestion that we have a constitution which is more of a suggestion? It's like a notebook where you just note things and to-do list and you are not to-do list. I, I think chapter 6 of our constitution, and I say this with a lot of respect to the lawyers because I'm one of them, should be removed because it's never followed. 
That thing on leadership and integrity is one hollow thing that is, is there but we don't follow. Because we have 50 million Kenyans, but every time we have to choose cabinet, we start with the most horrible ones, the most with the highest number of cases, the most the guy people who people are known to have stolen a lot of money. Those are the ones we start with in appointing. So there's a way for rewarding mediocrity. There's a way for insulting chapter six of our constitution, which is very sad. Is then Africa independent enough? We are trying. We are not where we were in the 90s when the president could detain you without trial. It's a process, I said, it's a journey. We will not get there tomorrow morning, but for sure we will get there someday. And something else we, we know and we actually talk about it often is that there's always a hand behind all these things that happen. And the hand is not African. At some point I was beginning to get happy when um, Biden said he's not buying because William Ruto is Biden's son in Africa. And that's how we were finding ourselves doing what the U.S. wants us to do. I would have been happy if Trump took over because Trump would trumpet all over all these nonsense and agreements they had made. But now Kamala Harris is coming out very strongly and we don't know how that will turn out to be. But I wish we had a U.S. president who does not care about interfering in the African politics and who tells Africans, go sort your mess out. Yeah. And, and we sort ourselves out from here, then it would have been good. They will keep interfering because they have a lot of interests here. They've invested a lot of money here. And of course, they milk a lot of money from us. They'll only tell you how much they give you. They don't tell you how much they need. I mean, the American embassy alone, look at how much they're collecting visa fees and how many people they give visas. That's a, that embassy is sustained on our resources. So there's a lot of things that go on that are wrong, that should not be happening. But what do we do? How does Africa then push itself to get out of this Western powers holding? Is there a way out or is, is it like a done uh, deal? Uh, as I told you, first and foremost, let's elect the right people. When we get the right people in that space, they will get there and they'll have to balance between the interests of their people and the interests of the Western powers. The unfortunate thing is that the ones we have there, whenever they get there, the West tells them what to do. Now, we want to elect people like Fanyamambo who will go there and tell the West, wait a minute, uh, we have our own agenda, and this is what our agenda is. So, and, and until that time comes, we will continue to have these problems. We have to put the right people in place. There is no shortcut about it. Okay. Yeah. And you've been watching the Olympics, I want to believe. Yes, I tried. You tried. <laughs> so, um, with your trial, um, did you watch the opening ceremony? For status. It was painfully ugly. You know, I, okay, I, I like stating my facts right. I am painfully straight. And um, the bulk of Kenya, the bulk of Africa is. And you could see there's a rainbow agenda that was really being pushed in that opening ceremony. Which will not find acceptance in Africa, by the way. You will not tell us to marry men and you will not tell women to marry women and they will not accept. And I want to be known on national TV. I'm not an apologist for those people who are trying to take the whole of alphabet. They started LGBTQ. Well, they want to take even Z now. So we are not an apologist for those people. And by the way, they can go. We don't care. And we have no sympathy for them. So do you think and here in Africa, we have no room for them. And, and, and that idea is not going to work. So even if they try pushing it, I, I watch some cartoons in the house sometimes and I tell my daughter, don't believe in this crap. It's not true. It doesn't happen. God will bless you with a fine young man. You'll marry a man, not this rubbish of telling you to marry a woman. So that is why it was difficult for me to watch. And it was difficult for many Africans to watch because they felt this thing is not even now like Olympics. So uh, do, you, do you think Olympics is political? It's not political. I'm just telling you it went to a joke of a country that you know is making those cars. I told you where fuse number one is for the vehicle, for the radio. That's the most important item in that car. I think they make better radios than everything else in their car. So uh, if you ask me... So uh, you think if it was in, say, China? Ch China is good. I mean, China, that's not an agenda for them. China, that's not an agenda for if them. If it's right? held in U.S.? I don't know how they would behave. It depends on the states because That's also why I'm asking, each you, state you, is different in do, the U.S. Do, by do the you way, think, in terms of the, do you think Olympics or games has been politicized? 
It's not been politicized, it's been added rainbow colors, which is what we have a problem with. Just remove the rainbow from Olympics and it will be fine. Olympics have got five medals and we know their colors. They are not those ones for the rainbow. Just keep Olympics the way we knew it. Five rings, that's all. We don't want anything else with the Olympics. Let our young men come there and run, live with a few coins and come back. But also, there was this bit about Kenya struggling, eh? Yeah, Kenya has struggled. We have really struggled. struggled. What Uganda. do you think has cost us those problems? I'm happy. I'm happy because, you know, like when you watch that race where Ugandans really did well. Yeah. It was the 10,000 meters. Yes, the Ugandans did very well. And yeah, I mean, all of them are still Kenyans anyway, we know from Mount Elgon. And even you can see, when they finished, they were speaking the Kalenjin language, all of them together. Yo, you didn't hear. <laughs> so they were speaking the Kalenjin language. And I'm happy that Kenya has become a source of athletes. I wouldn't care if we're not able to take care of our athletes. I wouldn't care. And I'm inviting the whole world to come and buy our athletes. As long as you pay them well, they are our sons. If somebody makes, if somebody comes and runs for Bahrain and you saw that. Yes, the lady. And she makes 32 million. And if she had run for Kenya, she would probably have made... And given apartments. And exactly. I have no problem with that. I mean, come, let me tell you. There's a time I visited Tanzania at a time when they were preparing for the Olympics. And when they were doing the, 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 the 5,000 and the 10,000, the first three could barely clock the Olympic time. In Kenya, when they are doing the 10,000 and when they are doing the marathon, you know, the marathon is open when they are preparing to select... The first 80 people in the marathon have clocked the Olympic time. Which means the first 80 people can run. So I'm calling on the whole world, 80 countries. Because now what they usually do, they pick one, two, three. That's what they usually do. But the other 77 are qualified to run and actually win a marathon in the world. So what do we need to do? We waste a lot of talent. That is one race. You can imagine how many races are done. So, so, so what is just what come for the other 77, <laughs> no, me don't. pay them, put the UK name on it, put whatever, pay them, let them run for your no, country. Me don't That's fellow Kenyans to go. I want you to make money. But what would you what would what be, will you what do with the 77 you, what remaining? What would you tell um Murkomen, your friend, now that he's now the sports? You said he's a joker, so he was put in the most sporty ministry, now, perhaps. Murkomen and his expensive watches. First and foremost, um, he comes from a region that is a basket for athletes. My advice to him is, please, just parade everybody who clocks the Olympic time and tell the whole world, anybody who wants an athlete, come with money. Pay to these young people. Let them come and run for your countries. I don't mind hearing that the UK won, but it was a Kenyan who was on that race. You know, Ukraine now is fighting. They need something to endear themselves to the world and Russia. We can give them athletes. We have too many, you know. As long as they pay and those families are able to come and support their children and their brothers and sisters here at home, let us donate athletes to the whole world. In fact, let us dominate the Olympics. China was struggling. I saw this one race where the Japanese finished three minutes after everybody else. Now, those are people we need to donate athletes to. We tell them, in Japan, how many do you want? We have. They sign up. They get we need money in this country and we need to support <laughs> our young people. Money. Instead of these young people just wasting away in frustration, can you imagine you've clocked Olympic qualifying time and you can't leave your country. And there are countries near us here, like Uganda, who don't have people who can clock Olympic time. Let us donate these athletes for a fee. It is better than keeping them at home. But that makes a lot of sense. And something else that was um, a highlight for me was uh, boxing. Imani Khalif yes. from Algeria yes. went to box with some Italian uh, lady and the boxing match ended within 30 seconds yes. because the lady said she got, she was boxed, something she's never experienced. Electricity. <laughs> yeah, she felt like she, it's never, she's, she's been in many boxing uh, dresses, whatever, but she's never had such mm -hmm. a hit. Yeah. And the whole idea became then that the lady is now being said to be a man. Yes. And yet, um, the committee, Olympic, whatever committee, had done a test and she qualified, she passes as a woman. I think it's a new challenge for Olympics. They need to create a new category. For what do you, because she's not For men who are closer to women and for women who are closer to men in terms of their testosterone levels. No, but... Remember, you had Casta Semenya. Yes. And uh, she used to give a huge gap between herself and the others. She used to be in her own race all the time. And they used to say it's very easy. You can take a nurse to the washroom and check. 
and for sure they said she's female i didn't check myself but they said she's female um what people forget is scientifically our bodies have got different levels of testosterone so it's possible for you to have to have the female organ but there are more male hormones in you that's why you find in parts of west africa women who have beards um and then there are also men who have a lot of estrogen they look like girls and they have all sorts of funny behavior i mean it's an a level of you know the the gene the, the estrogen in them is quite quite high so those challenges will be there i mean even the olympics committee let us be kind to them it's not something they had anticipated would happen and they had never prepared themselves to deal with someone who carries a a, a female organ in their body but has got the genes of a man or the testosterone levels of a man and how do they start do dealing with that and and she probably wears those things that women wear once a month because of things that happen so you can't come and tell her now you you're not a man or a woman so and maybe she's grown up knowing she's a man i mean she's a woman all her life and she's bought sanitary towels and she's used to them so when you come and tell her you have you're a man it's also insulting to her so i feel it's something that is beyond us even for the olympics committee they had never anticipated that that would happen but it happens and they have to deal with it so what what would be like the way forward because they are not lgbtq they are sure they are willing yes the the way forward as i said is the olympics committee needs to ask themselves when this happens what is the best way and so instead of you know boxing is a very fair match because you hear there is bantam weight there is light weight there is heavy weight there is super heavy weight and so on and so forth So maybe they can start saying if they take you to the lab and your testosterone levels are beyond this amount of this level in as much as you are female we have a category now for people with testosterone levels above this so we'll have a masculine feminine fight yeah kind of what would I you mean, call it if you're part of IOC uh, they start encouraging <laughs> those women who have beards to go and get tested and probably join because by the time as a woman you're getting beards it means your testosterone levels are very high so i mean you just try that i know one in some church choir somewhere who sings bass and she's a lady um what do you do about that she just has a lot of male hormones in her body that one should probably have been the one fighting that lady and then she's also very tall and very strong i think she would box me so that that's what you need they need to come up with a category that is special okay yeah. cool and as we come to an end what would be your message to or your take about the happenings across africa and maybe now home across africa let us find an african agenda in everything that happens the europeans the the, the americans come with their agenda for africa the problem is that we flow with the agenda they bring in here that is their agenda for africa we need to ask ourselves what is our agenda for our continent and to 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 push forward that agenda i mean i told you the route of trip to the us had nothing else other than haiti and people said i'm hating our troops are in haiti but the roads we were promised are not here not even a bag of cement has been brought here how comes it was very easy to take our troops to haiti but it was not possible for the us which claims to be a superpower which is in doubt now when you think about china they claim to be a superpower they've not mobilized even one bag of cement one to build that super highway they promised us from nairobi to mombasa but already our troops are in haiti because the agenda that was happening at the us when the president went was about haiti and nothing else and i told the whole world this thing is about taking our kenyan boys because they are considered less human to go and die there <clears throat> these people come and tell you they have the best troops the best training they show you movies of americans moving in a single line entering a building sijui they are why are they not sending those ones to haiti they come to an african country that they consider poor and impoverished and third world and they consider our troops good for haiti but theirs are not good for haiti what is that training they talk about i keep asking them you keep saying oh you have a good unit i and you should see them in the movies and then they wear those clothes and then move in one file they break in a building everybody would think wow if you ever fight the us you'll die before you start the fight why are they not going to haiti why are they sending africans to haiti it's because they know that our men are good i'm not saying their men are not good but maybe they don't know how to fight now coming closer home we have a cabinet fellow kenyans it's not for you it's for it's an election it's an election campaign for 2022 it's a campaign that gives the president 
leverage in the areas where he thought he was weak. And it's a campaign that tries to weaken Mount Kenya politically for 2027. He has not built a cabinet to bring you drugs to hospital. That would have been seen in his choice for minister for education. I mean, for health. He has no interest whatsoever in whether your children go to school or they don't. The cabinet secretary for education who left Machogu brought his running mate. Who equally, if Machogu was that, you can imagine his running mate must have been weaker. So he has no agenda for your schools. This cabinet is about the 2027 re-election campaign. Stop expecting more. When you lay down your expectations, when you stop expecting too much from this cabinet, then you're good to go. But finally, allow me to mention about the person of Wycliffe, Ambetsa Oparanya. You know, sometimes I fight government so much. But Wycliffe Ambetsa Oparanya, I looked at his education record. And you know, Kibaki used to choose the best. Under Kibaki, he was a minister for planning. And uh, that was around the same time when the Vision 2030 was mooted. And he's done well for himself. Um, the people of Kakamega say he's done roads well. He's done good work. And he's one person who's never taken plea. He has cases against him, but he's never taken a plea in court for guilty or not guilty. I don't campaign for everyone. In fact, even a, a Paranya doesn't know me. I don't know him. They, they voted for him. It's their person. But allow me to say that there's a, that there's a glimpse ray of hope in Oparanya. We think that he could streamline cooperatives because of his previous record, because of what is contained in his CV, and because of the fact that he worked with Mwai Kibaki. I hope he doesn't get into this administration and become what this administration is. I hope he becomes a light that will shine the way for this administration and shows the administration how things used to work under Kibaki and how things are supposed to work and what would happen. So Oparanya, we have some little hope in you. Um, Kenyans have said many things, and I listen to them, and they are saying good things about you. Um, as to whether you will live up to their expectations is really up to you. For the rest of the cabinet, we wish you well. Joho, people are saying pharmacy and poisons board should have been brought to the Ministry of Mining. I don't know why they are saying that, but all the same, we wish this cabinet well. Thank you. As I will not comment on the cabinet personally <laughs> for personal reasons. But before I end, um, about a month ago, I went down in Sli to do a story because I learned that there's conflict between Kikuyus and Somalis in Sli because Kikuyus feel that Somalis have taken over their businesses and their whatever, whatever. Um, the story is actually, if you've not watched, the story is on YouTube channel. You can check the link below. You will see um, Isli <coughs> Somali take over. Then you can decide for yourself. What's your take on that? This is the last thing we're talking about. I think... It's not about Somali taking over Kikuyu businesses. First and foremost, let us be brutally honest with one another. It's about money that was given to what was called Asal counties, arid and semi-arid areas, that has not gone into developing Asal countries. Um, you remember there's a time a Garissa governor was found with five billion in his account and he couldn't explain. And there are so many of those. The bulk of the money that we work so hard for, you and me and everybody in this room and out there, is gone, is goes into devolution. And when it goes into devolution, it goes to some governors. Those governors have come up, bought land in Nairobi and built houses and built flats and built apartments. It's Lee, I can say without fear, that a lot of money that was meant for the development of Asal counties has gone into Isli. The purchasing power of these people is not equal to the purchasing power of the locals. Because the locals are paying taxes here in Kiambu, and then those taxes are being collected, put together, put in a basket, and given to some of these counties. You had a governor who was buying sodas for a million shillings a crate. That is what is happening in those regions. And do you think he's investing in Isiolo? No. They are investing in Nairobi. They are investing in Isli. They are investing in South Sea. And so it's not equal. It's not the same. We have to get to a place where we ask now, these are the governors from these other regions, because all of them are also still stealing. When they steal, where do they take their money? Unfortunately, some of them are building in Dubai, and it is known. They are buying houses all over the place. And this is what we need to stop. So the war in Isli is bigger than that. I mean, even if you were to remove the Somali community and bring in any other community that has got access to stolen public resources, 
access to money that of questionable resources and mean questionable resources, then you'll have a problem. So, and the Kikuyu community needs to realize one thing, uh, that traditional markets are changing. I have seen people who are fighting to control malls and shops. And I have seen young people who are selling a whole, I, I know a young man who owns a whole spare shop in his home, a garage, and he has a very good app on the phone. And people are ordering, ordering for Land Rover parts and he's delivering on motorbikes from his home. If you think that you'd be wealthy by running a mall and owning a mall, you're probably living in 1994. We are in an era, I mean, look at the most successful businesses. Look at Alibaba, look at all the others. The business model has to change and the thinking has to change. And the circumstances we're in right now are forcing people to change. If you are not thinking, shame on you. If you still think of fighting for the same resources, people used to fight over land a long time ago. Right now, people are fighting for shares in premium companies. People are fighting for intellectual property. People are fighting to own an AI app. You know, Facebook, how much land does Facebook occupy? And how much is it worth? How much land does, for example, Instagram occupy? And what is it worth? So anybody who is thinking in land terms, you live here like a madman going to get 50 acres of land. Your head is not helping you because Facebook is fitting on a very small space. It has no land of its own. But look at how much money it's making. So to my fellow Kikuyu brothers and sisters, I think it's a good challenge for you to start asking yourself. When all of you went and owned a lot of property in Dubai because we know Kikuyu's owned, who asked you? In the UK, the Kikuyu own a lot of property. In US, parts of Texas are even given funny names like Moranga and so on and so forth because Kikuyus have bought land there and built there. The world is changing. And there's no single community that will be comfortable and say this is our home. I mean, there are people in Eldoret who thought that Eldoret would be for an indigenous community. Today you go there, it's very cosmopolitan. Start accepting the fact that you cannot own everything the way you want to. And the world is changing. And change is the only constant thing in life. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing insights with us today. Thank you very we much. appreciate. And to you, our viewer, thank you so much for hanging out with us and watching this till the end. We appreciate you. And we hope, of course, by now you're already subscribed. If you're not, please be our member to support all the good work we keep doing here at Alpha House. So share, comment, and like our pages across. See you next time.